I'm pleased to bring to order uh, the afternoon plenary session. Um, first up this afternoon for us is Dr. Sergei Popov, um, a former Soviet bioweapons designer. Uh, Sergei might come off uh, from his history as something of a mad scientist. He was in charge of um, designing a new kinds of bugs for the Soviet bioweapons system and uh, as such um, using recombinant interferon uh, developing bugs that would be resistant to the conventional uh, prophylactic and therapeutic measures. It's uh, been a long um, travel for him from that former life to where he is now and he wanted to make sure that I told you how happy he is to have left his former life and to be in this country now. Please join me in welcoming Sergei Popov. Hello. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. And first of all, I need to start with a small disclaimer. I think uh, weather in Seattle is just beautiful. <laughs> and its conclusion after 35 years in Siberia, where winter is uh, nine months long. And the second disclaimer I, I would like to say is that I don't have any interest private or any other, talking about what I'm going to talk about. First of all, for a long time, I just wanted to, to forget what I've done and spent beautiful six years in Texas doing biomedical research in a very nice facilities and nobody even asked me what I did before. That's a wonderful country. <laughs> That will be certainly impossible in the Soviet Union. But now I feel that uh, I have a kind of responsibility to talk about what's been done and what we practically don't know. And more than that, it, it's a very interesting situation that some data I'm going to talk about have already been published, but nobody paid attention. On the other hand, there is uh, quite a lot of misconception about the Soviet program, what's been done, what was successful, what's not. And uh, for the majority of the uh, tasks, topics I would like to touch, there is no data available. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is just up to you to believe me or not, because Sincerely, we will have no solid confirmation. It's just my knowledge. So, let me start. It takes a little time to load. And this small movie will give you a kind of impression of what I'm going to talk about. It's very impressive and sometimes terrifying. So, um, the variety of bioweapons is a huge topic. And it's actually the first talk today on biology, on microbiology. And I'm not going to review in depth the uh, biological weapons. As I said, I would rather attract your attention to what is very little known and what is relatively new in the field of biological weapons. What all we heard about anthrax attacks uh, and a lot of people right now know quite a lot about anthrax, but all we heard about anthrax is just very old knowledge. And it's been there for a long, long time. 
So what's new in the field? We'll review it briefly. But first of all, let me start with some figures uh, taken from the document presented to the United States government in the year 2000. And it stated that bioterrorism accounted only for a small number of events. Actually, the total number of bioterrorism events counts up to 50 compared to 5,000 deaths of foodborne diseases, uh, medical errors, and so on, so on. So the question is, and the document actually concluded that we paid too much attention to bioterrorism. But it was the year 2000. Um, a little bit of history. In 1947, the United States government was very calm about bioterrorism. And probably it was right to dismiss exaggerated uh, notions about biological and chemical weapons. But in mid-90s, the situation completely changed. And now nobody doubts that we live in a very different world. So do we really pay very much attention to bioterrorism? I think not at all. And the reason is that the threat of bioterrorism goes far beyond simple casualties. It, it's an enormous psychological impact on society. And uh, we also have to take into account the potential for economic devastation. Biological weapons are very controversial. And sincerely, I have never believed that what Russians did and Soviets did would ever be applied in a battlefield. But ironically, the same kind of agents is very good for bioterrorists. And I would like to talk about biological weapons and uh, to touch bioterrorism issues, although I am not an expert in bioterrorism itself. So what we have is four usual classes of biological weapons, including bacteria, rickettsia, uh, viruses, toxins, and the fifth unknown class, engineered agents. And bacteria are very convenient. They don't require sophisticated equipment. They could be grown up on a very simple artificial media, could be easily separated from, from and concentrated and put into different preparations. Rickettsia are very close to bacteria, but viruses certainly stay apart. And uh, the, the most representative uh, smallpox virus is notoriously difficult to, gr to grow up. So it requires uh, sophisticated equipment, uh, special uh, trained personnel, and uh, very expensive, uh, very expensive actually in production. Nevertheless, in, in the former Soviet Union, there was a technology developed uh, which employed huge bioreactors, and uh, it's well known how to grow smallpox in, in, in cell culture. Toxins are considered uh, as a part of biological weapons, but usually uh, they are not very much attractive, although Saddam Hussein stockpiled botulinum toxin and uh, probably was ready to apply it. Um, regarding efficacy of biological weapons, I would like to show you this uh, very conservative estimate. And you'll see that from the total number of potential biological <coughs> agents, which is about 50 or maybe, maybe more, potential biological agents which could be used to create biological weapons, not all of them are equally good. And from this table, you'll see that Q fever and, say, anthrax are good because they, they could be spread with high efficacy. They inflict a lot of damage, including incapacitation and death. And some other agents, like cyphos, 
classically very important for public health are not considered to be a very good <coughs> biological agents for biological weapons. So what, what is a requirement for a good biological weapon? And uh, it's been a lot of struggle around these lines, you know, because what I experienced in my uh, professional life, it, it's always um, the desire of military people to make uh, every agent to be as lethal as possible, to kill as fast as possible, to be ideally uh, suitable to, to be uh, produced at high scale, on high scale, and uh, should have some desirable, desirable characteristics as well, such as the capacity to protect troops against the possible biological agent. But again, ironically, you know, in the uh, Soviet biological program, the protection means uh, attracted very little attention. Nobody cared about protection. And uh, I've been asked several times, why, why it happened this way? Why didn't you uh, develop protection means against biological weapons, but designed more and more sophisticated agents? And the answer was that probably uh, those agents, they've never been considered to be applied on the native, in the native country. They were explicitly designed to be applied overseas. Say for, in different places far away from the Soviet Union. Among those characteristics you see a short and predictable incubation period. Uh, predictable persistency and uh, convenience of use. And what I would like to say that for, uh, for the purpose of terrorists, it's not that important. And I'll get back to this issue later, uh, briefly. But what's important uh, is that a good biological weapon is a big compromise. It's a compromise <coughs> in between Virulence, stability, ease of use, and other properties. So if it's difficult to spread, or if it's unstable in battlefield conditions, it doesn't matter if it has high virulence. So it, it, it's a fine balance, but again, for the terrorist purposes, it may not matter at all. So. The classical requirements for the biological weapon, for military application and terrorist applications could be quite different. So the stability of formulation sometimes it's not that important. You know, classical um, anthrax weapon is stable for years, and it was even a problem to destroy stockpiles of Russian anthrax, which had been produced in, in the amount of tons. The scale of production is also not, not a big concern for terrorists because, as we've learned today, one, two grams of anthrax is enough to kill a large number of people. Efficacy, as a result, is not a big concern at all. So it's quite feasible that in some you know, basement conditions, an experienced person could produce biological agents but it's, of course, uncertain whether it really had been the case. And looking back in history, we know that some cases of, of such type really took place. In 1915, in Washington, D.C., a German scientist successfully produced Pseudomonas malae to infect horses for European forces and he did not infect himself. And it was, as I said, in, in the city, in, in his private house. But taking into account all requirements for good biological weapon, and again, the um, 
requirements for vaccination and so on, it still seems to be improbable that homemade biological weapons would be a big threat. I would rather say terrorist states are more important. And those could easily um, have enough capacity for relatively small scale production of, of the variety of biological weapons. Looking at, at the history of biological weapons, we may ask a question, what biotechnology revolution may have uh, in common with biological weapons? Will they uh, always be the same, the same anthrax, the same plague? And many people believe that new biological agents have no future. But I think it, it's a wrong impression. Look at the potential for genetic manipulation. It's enormous. Essentially, it's possible to design new diseases from scratch, sometimes create unusual combinations of uh, classical agents. And since the, the capability, the biotechnology revolution provided with since they exist, I think that this possibility will be explored sooner or later. And that's, that's essentially what the Soviet program tried to achieve, to explore an unusual possibility, to create something which nobody even thought about. So briefly, uh, looking at traditional techniques to create biological weapons, we can conclude that they are still very val valuable. Uh, we can read open literature on how to create antibiotic-resistant anthrax. It's been published, and it's a very short paper, and it describes, like within a month, the uh, anthrax bacteria could be several times more antibiotic-resistant. So it's still a very good instrument. But one of the examples I witnessed myself is so-called Ustinov strain of Marburg. And you know that Marburg is, is a very dangerous disease with essentially no protection. And uh, the uh, most virulent strain had been isolated from the uh, body of my, one of my colleagues who died from Marburg in Siberia around 1986. It was, it, it's, it's a very awful disease so that even his family could not, could not withstood visiting him um, before his death. But the uh, virus isolated from his, uh, his body was the most virulent compared to um, other strains available at that time. What can we expect from recombinant techniques? As I said, it, it's an enormous potential and possibility to design new kinds of diseases. Some people call them designer diseases. And what could be a recombinant engineered agent there is no definition for these kind of things. Some people call it recombinant agents, some genetic. I prefer engineered. But it doesn't matter. Uh, what it is, it, it's a weapon, it's an artificial microbe created by manipulations with its DNA. And why DNA? And that's very simple because DNA encodes for everything in biology, and it, it could be called a mother of all molecules. And DNA is as simple as a biological text. One just needs to know how to write in this specific language, and then a new kind of biological agent could be created this way. Of course, it's, it's, it's a simplification. And uh, some people doubt 
with the biological, new biological agents are feasible. But it's not really a question already because we know they are. And it's been done. But still, it's a difficult task. Look at HIV studies. For 20 years, there was some progress. But really, it wasn't enough to eradicate the disease. Soviet program existed for 25 years. In 1975, the first institution on this program had been uh, established. And in comparison, you know, to create a nuclear bomb took less than five years. So biology is enormously complicated in this case. But still, it's possible. And if we look at the, at the nature, we see that in natural cases, you know, we can, we can isolate Staphylococcus, which is resistant up to 14 different antibiotics. <coughs> Tuberculosis uh, became resistant to, in many countries, to all possible antibiotics. New diseases appeared, such as uh, HIV, herpes viruses, filoviruses, hepatitis of, of different kind, and even inoculus E. coli became an important pathogen. And the list of, of naturally occurring uh, emergent diseases is about 30 or even more different agents. So nature is very good in creating new biological beasts so that people probably can do the same. So what kind of biological agents can we suggest or how could it be done? First of all, it's a simple classical technique, gene modification and transfer. And the easiest task is to create multiple antibiotic resistant bacteria. And you can imagine what would happen if uh, anthrax in recent attacks was antibiotic resistant. There would be no cure and thousands of postal workers would simply die. Vaccine resistance sometimes sounded like something um, impossible to achieve. But surprisingly, some open literature we've talked, we'll talk about showed that in this direction there was a considerable success. Although it was very difficult to create vaccine-resistant smallpox, and protection against smallpox with, with vaccine, although limited, but still uh, seemed to be a very good idea. Toxins were considered as a very good complement to natural virulence factors. And uh, some strains of different bacteria with expressing toxins have been successfully created. We can go further and we can employ much more sophisticated ideas like autoimmune diseases, which essentially means that the bacteria or virus may serve as a trigger, as a switch to turn immune response against the body, but not against the microbe. Another uh, early idea is so-called bioregulators, which may include cytokines, different mediators of, of uh, septic shock, uh, anaphylactic excuse me, so shock reaction, and neuropeptides. It's, uh, neuropeptides is, is a simple concept. You know, if something, if our mental and uh, other activities, you know, are controlled by peptides, what if the microbe would do it? There's uh, little consequences. And uh, what if the microbe produce neuropeptides which may change human behavior, perception of reality, and many, many other things? One more approach a complete chemical synthesis. I'm, I'm confident nobody of you even heard about the possibility to create <coughs> viruses from, as we say, 
carbon, air, and water. But it's possible. And it's complete block by block, molecule by molecule, assembly of, of viral DNA. And it could be done in, say, in 1980. Uh, several viruses have been blueprinted. And they were of HIV size or SV40 size, which is about several thousand nucleotides long. And it would take only a couple of years for my department to assemble each of them. But right now, the capacity is much bigger. And automated chemical synthesis is a routine approach. So that if, it, if you think about artificial viruses, you can think about something like prions, the agents causing so-called small, uh, uh, slow infections. And those are so small that almost everybody with a PhD degree can, can produce those in artificial conditions. And I'm just surprised and I'm really concerned that this had already been done by somebody. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, other small pathogens have been considered as potential pathogens. Take into account viroids, small pieces of RNA being spread over uh, plants cause a lot of damage, agricultural damage. And you know what, you can imagine what could happen in case of uh, not only, you know, uh, pathogens uh, killing humans, but pathogens for livestock and uh, agricultural plants. Another approach Manipulation with whole genomes. We don't need even to, uh, to know what's inside. You just try, we can try to combine viruses and bacteria. And that kind of disease would be absolutely difficult to recognize and to deal with. And I'll give you later an example of such a disease. We can combine different viruses in one. And that was a subject of a special program called Bonfire. And uh, some people have got a lot of enemies talking about it because nobody in Russia wants even to think about it. And of course, they, they don't acknowledge the existence of the program. One more slide on hypothetical possibilities. And that's, this time, it's not what I dealt with. It's what's been taken from the literature, but not from scientific fiction, from real solid scientific publications. Stealth viruses introduced into human genome, which could be turned on and off, depending on the particular conditions or the will of the person who did it. Double-stranded RNA interference, essentially the same approach where certain genes, certain very important parts of DNA could be turned on and off. And that, that is a very uh, scary possibility, although hypothetical at the moment. So what, what worries me a little, a lot when I read and think about the directions of future research regarding new biological agents is that every day we have so many possibilities to create something new and deadlier than before. Look at, at the approach called direct molecular evolution. That's a perfect way to create new viruses just by recombining different pieces. And it's a very uh, uh, kind of uh, 
fashionable approach right now. Almost everybody recombines everything, beginning from uh, chemical compounds and uh, uh, including DNA. Minimal microbial genome, very innocuous program. But when I look at this, from my point of view, I see that is what, you know, the Soviet program would certainly be very glad to use. So it, it, it essentially defines building blocks for new pathogens. What could function and how could function independently on, in different combinations. So uh, briefly about the program itself and some facts which are known or what I suggest had been done. The, the program itself began a long, long time ago. That's why it is uh, kind of troublesome. 20, uh, more than 26 years ago, uh, the, the program began with, with the establishment of a huge number of research institutes all across the country with, with, with a scope of 1,000 people involved. Some estimates were about 60,000 people involved in the program. Deeply classified and included several special programs, which were the, the most secret among the, all of them, including what I'm talking about. And what's interesting, and nobody took into account, that the special cover stories were developed. So the, the large number of people worked on artificial publications <coughs> on developing stories how to cover up the activities of such a large number of people. And the first ideas were to create psychoactive microbes, as we discussed it, to express different bioregulators as uh, endorphin, a short peptide well known in the scientific literature and in medicine. So uh, the idea was to overexpress, to make bugs producing this kind of stuff and uh, put them into highly virulent strains of smallpox, other pathogens, plague, and so on, so on. And the program went on and ended up with uh, this publication. It, it's a small piece of, of uh, iceberg on the top of the whole program, but what's interesting here, it, it's an evidence that the, the agent of this type had been created and what kind of new properties it had. So the publication describes vaccine strains. So take into account that vaccine strain is the, the easiest way to see what peptide itself does to, to the infected animal. If you include the same peptide into a virulent strain, it would be very difficult to, to study it. So uh, the recombinant strains caused reduction or, or sensation of pain and generalized muscular catatonia, which is a, essentially is a mental stupor. In simple terms, it means if somebody, if person or animal gets infected with this, the perception of, uh, of reality would be absolutely different. On top of uh, highly virulent infection, that would mean that infected animals and people change their behavior, and they even cannot, cannot move properly because of the muscular paralysis. And the paper suggested to use Yersinia, which is causative agents of plague, to create these kind of agents further, to study further these possibilities. One more approach is so-called horror autotoxicus. When the, the, the microbe serves as, as a switch, a trigger, as I said before, and destroys, in this case, 
the uh, shield which surrounds nerve tissue in spinal cord and in brain. So the result is the death of individual after initial symptoms of infection. Then it takes a short while, about two weeks, and the new wave of symptoms comes. And that new wave of symptoms has nothing in common with disease itself, which caused it. So if somebody in, in a hypothetical case would contract this kind of disease and would have recovered from the disease, that would essentially mean not very much. The, the person would die inevitably because of the autoimmune reaction against it. his body against himself or herself. And that's, that's a proof of concept. So what's been done in this case, vaccinia virus, which is inoculus viruses, but the same smallpox essentially in nature, has been created. And the small insert of myelin gene made this virus deadly in the uh, oval at the bottom, you see zero from 42. Zero from 42, that's, that's how deadly is vaccinia. No death at all. And 14 from 47 and 19 from 47, that's the number of dead and sick animals after inoculation of recombinant strain. And that's that's a typical example how pox virus could be created. And the, the uh, <coughs> virulence of this kind of agent would be up to 80-90%, taking into account that a natural virus kills only 40, 30, maybe 40% 40 of people. And. Uh, it's been actually described how to create this virus in, in details, but nobody paid attention. Maybe it was a hint from Russians, look what we can, look what we can do, how would you respond? But nobody responded for some reason. In late 80s, uh, the work went further from creating smallpox to bacterial agents of the same nature. So uh, a whole bunch of different pathogens has been, had been um, tried. And what came out was quite unusual. Quite unusual because a very innocuous bacterium causing mild pneumonia, Legionnaire's disease, sometimes deadly, but not really really that important for biological weapons, became so virulent that only one to three cells per animal were capable to induce autoimmune disorder. And the uh, symptoms of this, of this infection, again, were quite unusual. So in case of uh, this kind of disease, antibiotic treatment would be very efficient but in two days, almost all animals were paralyzed. And the plants were uh, to go further and to do experiments on monkeys. And it was 1992 when the experiments were stopped. And I don't know any other data on these. Uh, I suppose all the data were transferred to the military facilities and uh, the program continued in different places. But what happened in this country, you know? As I said, nobody cared. Nobody read literature. Well, I mean, what Russians published. And 10 years later, they decided that they were the first. I was glad to read this paper because, first of all, when I talked about the research which had been done in the Soviet facilities, nobody believed. <coughs> nobody believed that it's possible to create such a virus 
But that's, that's an independent data that it's really could be done. But unfortunately, 10 years later. What else had been done? You see, uh, again, very explicit paper explaining how to create agents which suppress the capacity of human body to struggle with infections. It's been designed and uh, kind of scientifically um, substantiated how to do it. Okay. And uh, seven years later, in Australia, the same principle has been confirmed. But this time, the work attracted a lot of attention, simply because the authors explicitly stated that the virus, mousepox virus they created, is a blueprint of a smallpox, which could kill all experimental animals and, and maybe all people infected. So what else could be done, you know, and how it continues? Nobody knows. But again, what worries me is that in 1998, a collaboration of American scientists and the Russian BW program with peaceful purposes described a more virulent anthrax, oh, excuse me, more virulent smallpox. And it's so simple as a few substitutions in, in smallpox genome. And the new outcome cited from the paper is a severe tissue destruction and high virulence in infected animals. So we see that this paper has an obvious biological weapon applications. And it's, it's really, really very simple. One more approach, you've probably got tired of those, but this is the most, the most impressive from my point of view. That is how to combine different viruses in one, and later on, how to create bacteria which contain virus inside. This kind of disease would have uh, absolutely um, devastating properties. Say, uh, the probable uh, agent is a plague microbe with a virus like VEE or Ebola inside, so that if we treat against plague, the virus gets released. And then treated people essentially kill themselves with the treatment. So whatever you do, it's lethal. And that's because antibiotic treatment may easily release bacteria, a virus from bacteria. One more example, and that's not only a hint, but it's explicitly targeted publication which described how anthrax which is resistant to existing American vaccine could be designed. And it's been, this time, it's been noticed and produced a lot of trouble, although uh, the Russians this time said, oh, don't worry very much, you know, it's just research. We didn't have any intention to scare you because the agent is not stable, it, it's not a weapon at all, just kind of exercise, you know, what can be done for peaceful purposes. <laughs> but uh, in response, you know, the United States requested a strain from Russians to check if it's so simple, you know, and so innocuous, and it's never been actually this train has never been sent for different reasons, for postal regulations and so on. <laughs> so
So uh, the question is, why did it happen? Was it a simple matter of, you know, what was it? I don't know how to define this this condition, you know, but what Russians inspected is, was a meticulous, scrupulous, you know, everyday intelligence effort to reveal the existence of the program. And the, the countermeasures were so sophisticated that even, you know, basketball fields were built next to research labs to convince that the basketball field and research lab is a kind of, you know, inhabited, you know, hostel with many people playing games around and uh, so that from satellite intelligence data there would be no, no uh, kind of doubt that it was uh, just something innocuous. Uh, there were, uh, as I said, there were publications, dual purpose research, special people trained, you know, to provide special kind of uh, data for, for foreigners and so on and so on. Some people were sent abroad to describe so-called open legend. So it was a massive effort, but all for nothing, because nobody cared. Look at this simple, simple test. 2,000 people produced one paper in 1984. Very nice scientific institute. And then when everything collapsed, the Soviet Union collapsed, 30-something 30, 30 papers have been published in the same year, reflecting that a lot of scientific data had been accumulated and were just released out. But then you see a trend, then they exhaust it, or maybe they don't publish anymore. We don't know. But that's kind of troublesome. Who else is involved? We don't know who else is involved. We know that more than 17 countries possess biological weapons, and the research in these directions could be done in any of them because it does not require very sophisticated equipment and uh, it, it does require some knowledge but it could be acquired. We know that some people approached Russians and some Russians traveled to Middle East and other countries including uh, North Korea on several occasions. I found myself that some of the constructs made in my department ended up in Cuba as a gift from Brezhnev to Fidel Castro. It was interesting to know. <laughs> but it, nobody cared. Again, you, nobody asked my permit, although I keep some patents on these. And uh, a lot of things like this happened in the Soviet Union. It reminded me the story with uh, vaccination, so that the whole population of the Soviet Union had been vaccinated against uh, battle toxin, and nobody knew about it because the vaccine had been mixed with polio vaccine. So everybody had been vaccinated against polio, but received another portion to be protected against battle toxin. What to do to, to stay protected? That's a difficult question. And we see that offense is much more aggressive than defense in this case. So it has to be changed. They should be way around it. And uh, we know that a lot of bioweapons could result from innocuous research. So some people suggest, and I agree with them, that and new bioethics could be, should result from, from legi legitimate research. And what we need, we need to overlap, uh, overcome reluctance to talk about biological weapons. Every scientist doing research in this field has to 
realize what could be a consequence of a particular research. And since those specific uh, sensitive areas will be defined, research programs are necessary. Specific research programs to address the potential threat of new biological agents. So here we have happy end. Soviet biological facility says you happy new year and happy Christmas. And they survived because they, they recently get some, got some grants from the Department of Defense. But the question still remains, do we need Ebola virus in Siberia? That's it. Thank you.